name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, unto the ages of all ages, Amen. Good morning. Today's meditation is entitled, United Against Racism. And after a brief introduction, I'm going to be speaking uh, primarily about three main points, being a theological foundation, challenges of an ethnic church in the diaspora, and moving forward. Then I will conclude my meditation. Today uh, we celebrate the glorious feast of Pentecost, which means the 50th day following the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The scriptures uh, tell us that all the disciples were gathered in the upper room and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. And one sat upon each one of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Also, it was on this very day that peoples of all nations and tribes and cultures came together in Jerusalem and as they uttered many languages, it represented a new beginning and the birth of the church. This is the day that the church was transformed from an ethnic church or community into a multicultural church. From just looking at the world being divided into Jew versus Gentile, into a universal community, and from a message focused on a specific and a chosen people into seeing God as one who cares for the entire creation. This is the day when our horizons were opened up and the true message of Christ being the savior of the whole world was realized as we all came together into the descent of the Holy Spirit to speak in different tongues and to be assured that our God is the God of each and every human being that he has created on his own image and likeness. In the past couple of weeks, the whole world has been reacting to the murder of George Floyd an unarmed African-American who died in Minneapolis, Minnesota on the American Memorial Day, May the 25th, 2020. After a white police officer knelt on his neck for almost nine minutes, Mr. Floyd was handcuffed and lying face down at the time. He repeatedly told the four police officers, please, I can't breathe. Demonstrations protesting against Mr. Floyd's death and racial injustice have been staged in more than 400 cities across North America and around the world, as well as right here in Toronto in these past few days. Let's begin by defining what racism is. The Oxford English Dictionary defines racism as prejudice, discrimination, or antagonism directed against someone of a different race based on the belief that one's own race is superior. The topic of racial justice or injustice is very close to my heart, but I didn't want to rush to speak about it since its beginning because I wanted to spend some time in prayer and in isolation to see what God's will is for this subject and how best to address it. I also wanted to spend time speaking with people in different consultations, which is exactly what I did this week by speaking to different groups from so many different backgrounds to see what the feedback should be and how to address this specific topic. I pray that uh, today would not be uh, just a sermon or another talk, but it's actually a moment of soul searching and of self reflection where we can all come out of it thinking, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to do? And where do you want me to go from here? What should I do to change my decisions and to change my actions towards others whom you have created? Let's begin by looking at this subject by defining a theological foundation and understanding where God stands in terms of racial injustices and how he looks at the world. Our Lord Jesus acknowledged racial tensions in his context and came as a healer to the world. 
in his reference to the Ethiopian queen of Sheba, he acknowledged that she will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Matthew 12:42. As a sub-Saharan African woman, our Lord acknowledged her presence and significant role on the day of judgment in opposition to contemporary understanding of ethnic and gender roles which existed in the Middle Eastern culture at that time. Furthermore, the book of Acts recounts the encounter of the Apostle Philip with the righteous Ethiopian official who was reading the book of Isaiah and asked to be baptized in the book of Acts chapter 8. In this story, this healing encounter assured everyone of God's covenant with his African or sub-Saharan children who are empowered with the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the context of the New Testament, St. Paul affirms that there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are one in Christ Jesus, Galatians 3.28 which is a very significant and important foundation for our understanding of racial injustices that have been happening in our world today. God's love for humanity has been proclaimed and there is no discrimination from God's perspective. St. Paul's speech also in um, his visit to Athens mentioned in Acts 17 he was quoted as saying, and he, referring to God, has made from one blood or from one ancestor every nation of humans to dwell on all the face of the earth. How is it possible that God's beautiful creation was marred by human injustices and faulty actions to discriminate against any race or nation? To look at this concept of the theological foundation we can summarize it from the words of St. Peter in Acts 10 that God shows no partiality. Each person is equally welcome to salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Today is not the day that I will go into a history lesson to speak about the racial injustices which happened to Afro-Caribbean communities throughout the centuries, treating them and looking at them unfortunately as beasts intellectually and morally inferior than whites and descendants of apes. I'm sorry to say these words. Such horrific claims were used to justify the system of chattel slavery, which is the personal ownership of a slave that enslaved millions of African Americans and Canadians. Many slave holder, holders convinced themselves that slaves, due to their supposedly inferior nature, were better off and better cared for in bondage than in freedom. In the 19, early mid-19th century, a census was taken which uh, showed that over four million slaves of African-American descent uh, were just in the U.S. The great Nelson Mandela said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate and if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. Let's look from within ourselves because there's a lot of media coverage that um, focuses on ethnic diversity and um, racism. But I think the best way at this time is for us as a community, as a Coptic community in the diaspora, to judge ourselves, as the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 11, for if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. And that's why a part of this self-reflection is to look inside. And it's very easy for us to say, well, I'm not for example, a racist, or I'm not a white person, or I haven't had or held any slaves. And just to treat this topic as external and wash our hands from any kind of responsibility towards it. But I believe that this is the time to face our anxieties and insecurities concerning race relations and why we as a Coptic community are still struggling with this racism, even within 
our churches. One of the first challenges that is facing us as an ethnic church in the diaspora, meaning outside of its birth home, which supposedly is Egypt, where the Coptic church came from, is ethnocentrism. This is defined as the belief that one's culture is superior to all other cultures. And again, we must acknowledge our privilege and our power as we come together in a church community. Maybe this is a minority within the greater culture, but as we come together to church and we become a majority, we continue to practice this ethnocentrism where you know people are extremely proud of their Egyptian heritage. This is not to say that people shouldn't be, but the stress on how Egyptian we are as a church is dangerous because it confines and limits our mission our, and our exposure and our expansion into the community. Yes, this is good for a culture center or a community center where people of similar ethnicities may come to celebrate together food and music and language. But when it's deeply rooted in a church community, it's very tragic because it excludes people. People can understand when we speak a foreign language. People don't feel that they belong. And when we speak this language, besides someone who doesn't understand it, they feel that they are not part of this community or they are always looked upon as the other. Also related to it is the sense of nationalism, which is the identifications with one's own nation and support for its interest, especially to the exclusion or the determinant of the interest of other nations. We have to come out of this model of nationalism and ethnocentrism into more a healing community for all people of all nations and all cultures and specifically to the Afro-Caribbean community who had been historically austerized from mainstream communities, especially in, in North America. And there's a lot of history surrounding that. It is very dangerous in a church setting. It's exclusionary by nature. And one of the greatest challenges of the Coptic church today is to become a truly universal church as we proclaim in every divine liturgy and in the creed. The majority of its members are still ethnically homogenous and it becomes intimidating to everyone seeking membership in this community. Another point of concern for an immigrant church and an ethnic community is its view on blackness. And this is manifested and embodied in the story of the great saint, the strong saint, Ava Moses. And I know that this story was not originally a racist story because the church call, calls him the strong saint, Ava Moses. Pigori is a web of a Moses. Which means that the history of the church looked at his spiritual strength. But through bad translations, I believe, this story had turned into a very racist story mention of a great saint and he was turned into Saint Moses the black identifying him by his skin color and I'm going to mention part of his story which is mentioned in the Senexarium and we have to be very careful about our literature and our liturg liturgical wordings and how it describes the saints because it could turn out against us in a very racist way this is verbatim from the Senexarium reading and I pray that it will be revised. The story first, first explains the saint very stereotypically as identifying him as a slave of a vicious character who killed and robbed and committed fornication. No one could stand up before him for his might and he escaped from his master and became a ring leader. And as a result of his increased asceticism, Unfortunately, the Senexarium explains him as his body becoming like a burnt wood, which is also another very racist, uh, racially um, charged term. The patriarch, which is one of my greatest challenges in this story, the patriarch wanted to test St. Moses before ordaining him as a priest. So he said to the elders, who brought this black man here? 
And another challenge with the translation from Arabic to English is that we see that in Arabic it says, who brought this black man here? And when I looked at translation yesterday, it said, who brought this Ethiopian here? Which is not a literal translation, probably to water down the racist remark. Cast him out. And in all humility, the monk obeyed and left saying to himself, it is good what they have done to you, O black colored one. What a tragedy. It is implying that after a black man received these racist remarks, a show of his humility was that he just rolled over and walked away. And when the patriarch, however, saw his humility and endurance, he called back of a Moses and ordained him to the priesthood and said to him, Moses, you have now become entirely white. My challenge with these statements would be the following. Number one, who wrote this story? From which perspective? This is a story which occurred in the fourth century. So Arabic was not its original language. It must have been translated maybe more than once. And what kind of biases existed at the time? Did the patriarch truly say these degrading words to a great saint in order to test him? Did anyone object to these words? Were these words signs of righteousness or signs of racist remarks against the saint? And who recorded the fact that he just rolled over and accepted these racist remarks? On a deeper level, as we look at monastic virtues in the 20th century, and even if we try to explain it, which I hope we don't justify it in any way, how do these statements apply to today's world? Do they impact people or persons in leadership positions as a model of what that patriarch said or did at that time? Do we still aspire to these words to keep them in our Senexarium as a model of treating one another? Does righteousness equal whiteness and sin equal blackness? These are all important questions that we must ask ourselves in the 21st century and have an answer for them. What have these remarks and how have they impacted generation after generation in our race, racial relations between our brothers and sisters of Afro-Caribbean descent? We must be extremely careful and I pray that this specific and other stories will be revised to look at the original intentions and language. I don't believe that these racist remarks existed in the fourth century. This is all new terminology that portrays, you know, black men as beasts and, and, and as, uh, you know, the way that St. Moses was portrayed and the difference between blackness and whiteness in terms of righteousness. We have to be very careful on our literature and how it impacts our understanding of spirituality and godliness. Furthermore, in our iconography, Jesus is often represented as an Anglo-Saxon, white Caucasian, blonde hair and blue eyes savior, while often the devil is portrayed and appears as a black male with horns and a tail. This is a challenge. We have to be careful. Our iconography speaks a lot about our beliefs and practices and faith. We were very cognizant here in the church in terms of the multicultural presence in our iconography and not to portray Jesus in one way, not to portray the devil in this way and to show diversity within the iconography. But I've seen a lot of icons where that is the stress being probably impacted by European iconography and, and artwork. We have to be very careful what we say and how we project ourselves as a church community. Thirdly, a part of my uh, studies, I looked at cross-cultural marriages, which is an area of research where I noticed so many instances of racial injustices directed especially towards Afro-Caribbean communities. Families rejected potential spouses of their children due to their skin color or ethnic identity. This is a problem throughout the diaspora, even if they accept them with much resistance, they never receive full status as a copt. 
they are always viewed as an outsider where community fully embraces them. Church members speak around them in Arabic and often giving them uncomfortable and dirty looks. And on one occasion, they were asked by a deacon to leave the church. And I, uh, this is a true story that I heard from a church in another country about uh, less than two years ago where a couple were just starting to see each other and as they entered into the church, they went into their separate ways. So the black man had to stand by, by himself and immediately a de deacon rushed to him and told him, what are you doing here? Is this your church? This is not your church. Why don't you go to your own church? And he was asked to leave without any justifiable reason. These are true stories and we must acknowledge them and we must repent from them and we must go through soul searching and self evaluation to ask God for forgiveness and have a new start and a new beginning. These individuals were never viewed as part of the network, always seen as outsiders. The other extreme of this behavior for communities who are trying to become more open to diversity or to put individuals of Afro Caribbean heritage on a pedestal and overemphasize their presence as if they were a trophy. In this case, these individuals are always made aware of their otherness to the general community members. Both extremes are not good, but looking at each person, each human being as the beautiful creation of God. And as we all deal with one another with extreme courtesy and love and respect and human dignity, so also we treat members of our community in the same way. Persons of other ethnicities are often targeted for to sexual exploitation. And I've often heard this from especially women who embrace the Orthodox faith, that many men approach them asking for sexual favors, thinking that they are an easier target or they don't have the same morals. What a shame by members of the community. The scripture says, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? We have to be careful to project our faith in the right way. Let's look at a few suggestions moving forward. First of all, we have to be careful. Thinking that good intentions are enough. Some people justify themselves saying, well, I was never a slaveholder, or I never said any bad or negative or racial slurs, slurs, but we are quiet. Or we can listen to others saying these slurs and not stand up to these injustices. That makes us a part of the crime. Remember the four policemen, one of them had his knee on the neck of George and the three others just stood by and did, did nothing. They were also, or they are also going to be judged and charged with a crime. Denial of light skin privilege, whiteness. And yes, the Middle Eastern community has a lighter skin color in general. And this is a privilege and a power that we much must acknowledge and work together in order to alleviate these um, gaps that exist between races. Not believing the experiences of persons of color, saying they are overestimating. No, it's been horrible for them. Denying that racism exists even within our communities. Or racial profiling. Or fearing persons of color. Or blaming the victim or trying to make ourselves or turn ourselves also into victims. What about me? What about the plight, of the plight of the cops in Egypt? For example, why are we forgetting them? When you have a hurting brother or sister, you want to stand by them and give them your full attention and acknowledge what they're going through rather than diluting the matter and thinking of other things. There are times to think of Coptic and Christian oppression in the Middle East, which is a real subject, but now we're all facing this subject about racism. It's great to say that the Coptic Church is the first African church and has handed the faith to the Ethiopian church, but how so we treat our African sisters and brothers? Are they fully integrated into our communities? Do they hold leadership positions? 
Are they an equal partner in the journey towards Christ? Do we see other people? Have we walked in their shoes? Have we experienced their hardships? These are all important questions that we must ask ourselves. Here are some suggestions also moving forward. Accountability to terminate any black or racial slurs that may degrade other persons or cultures even in private conversations. This is very common in our communities to say racial slurs and, and jokes and, and thinking you know, that we're, you know, it's funny or we're laughing at them, but we're embedding these racist remarks in our existence. Terminating and listening or supporting any music which includes racial derogatory slurs. Understanding our privilege and power. We have to start thinking of anti-oppression workshops sh shops that challenge people to get uncomfortable. And some of the things that we mentioned today definitely made us a bit uncomfortable. But we have to face our insecurities. We have to also pray for trained leaders to do this work. And I acknowledge and I confess that I, as a clergy person, have not done enough. And maybe I can share this sentiment with so many other clergy members. We need to know more, to, um, to learn more, to be able to preach about it more from the pulpit and speak about the existence of racism and discrimination within our communities. First generation immigrants and some second generation are certainly occupied with Christian persecution in the Middle East. But a vast majority of the next generation are concerned with challenges in their own homeland. Issues such as systemic racism, the environment, social justice, equality are the forefront of people's minds and must be adequately addressed. Before I conclude, I wanted to share with you a little poem that I wrote a few years ago and I shared a couple of times before and it's called I Have a Dream. On August the 28th, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech in front of hundreds of thousands of people being part of the civil rights movement. In the same spirit and on this glorious day of Pentecost, I also have a dream for our Coptic Orthodox Church. Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense? with all the merchant's fragrance powders. She is who is redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. She is the bride who is married to the great I Am. She is the fruit who is as sweet as honey and jam. She is the pure vessel without tarnish or spam. I love my church in her glory and pride. I adore my mother in whom I abide. I cherish my friend who remains a great guide. I treasure my bride who is always by my side. For many years I have sinned and before you I confess. I have shown partiality which hindered your success. Please help me to change and I know that God will bless. Today I have a dream which I want to express. I have a dream that one day all churches will be one. No more division but all united under the only begotten Son. I have a dream that God's love would shine through us like the sun, and this is when we know that eternity has begun. I have a dream that one day our church will be a place of restoration, of healing, of kindness, and experiencing God's salvation. I have a dream that one we can worship with the entire creation, people of every language, color, tongue, and nation. I have a dream that one day we'll stop judging people based on their color and race, but look a little bit deeper to their character and offer them a place. I have a dream that we can be a community reflecting God's amazing grace, a warm, loving, and caring people who are willing to embrace. I have a dream that we treat one another with a heart that is pure, with integrity and honesty, each other we can assure. I have a dream that we'd find for hatred and bullying a cure, that every child, youth, and adult would feel secure. I have a dream that everyone's gifts will one day shine. Our God-given talents will show his amazing design. I have a dream that one day everyone will be a branch in the true vine to taste the holy bread and drink of the Lord's wine. And now, my friend, it is up to you and me 
I believe it is clear what we need to do. Jesus died for Greek and Jew and every single person sitting in the pew. My dear friends, I think we have spoken enough and now it's time for action. It's time to have this conversation with our children, our family members, and every loved one in our community, whether it's coming from leadership, from servants, from individuals, we are all ready for a change. The early Christian Justin Martyr said of the fellow Christians, we who hated and destroyed one another and on are now ready an account of their different manners would not live with humans of different tribe. Now, since the coming of Christ, we live familiarly with all of them and pray for our enemies. I'm so thankful to God that this week, the Archdiocese clergy issued a statement that commits us all to education and to continue the conversation to act justly and love mercy. May our Lord Jesus bless us today and every day as we celebrate the feast of Pentecost. May this be a day of truly receiving the spirit of comfort who comforts our hearts and fills us with strength and power to face every injustice in the world and within our own communities. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.